Okay, uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining the webinar today. Um, today we're going to talk about the 3PL strategic advantage. Uh, my name is Josh Miller. I'm going to be the person presenting today. And uh, before we get started with the presentation, just a few um, housekeeping items. Uh, we do like to do a, a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So on the GoToMeeting, um, there is an area where you can submit questions. Um, you'll, you will be muted during the webinar, but at the end of the presentation, um, we'll address those questions. Um, if we don't get an opportunity to address your question on the webinar, uh, then we'll certainly follow up with you. Okay, great. Okay, so today uh, we're going to talk about uh, the 3PL industry. Um, specifically, we're going to focus on a few agenda items. Um, so we're going to start out by talking about the 2014 uh, holiday sell season. Um, so this is the period uh, really that retail considers to be from November 1st all the way through the end of the year. Um, so we'll look at that as well as uh, Black Friday and the actual Thanksgiving holiday. Um, from there, we're going to look at uh, general transportation trends in terms of what we've seen uh, from 2013 into 2014 and what we should expect um, going into 2015. Uh, with that, we will talk about the challenges that uh, are going to be facing shippers this next year in 2015. And then uh, really the focus of the webinar today is going to be on the logistics service market. So how 3PLs can take into account these challenges faced by shippers and position themselves in a way uh, to be able to provide additional value add and really enhance that partnership with the shipper customer. Um, from there, we'll take a look at the CTSI company overview. So we'll give you an, an overview of CTSI Global and look at some of our capabilities in relation to how it can help our 3PL customers. And then from there, uh, we'll go into conclusions and then open it up for QA. All right, so let's talk about the 2014 holiday sale season. Uh, so we call this the year of e-commerce. So surprisingly enough, even though the economy is on a rebound, um, Black Friday, so Thanksgiving Day and the following Friday, sales were down 11% in terms of total sales or revenue. So it went from $57.4 billion last year down to $50.9 billion this year. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, even though on the surface it, it may look that way. Um, what is really happening here is the... Uh, ability for customers to shop remotely and smarter and have additional options and not necessarily have to go to a busy mall or Walmart um, at a physical brick and mortar location on Black Friday. So when you look at uh, sales decreasing by 11%, you focus then on the online sales. So when you look at uh, online sales on actual Thanksgiving Day, they top $1 billion this year. And then on Black Friday, it surpassed uh, $1.5 billion. So that's a, a growth rate on Thanksgiving Day of 32% from last year. And then on Black Friday, uh, a growth rate of 26%. So if you take a, a little closer look at that, um, and we back up and we look at uh, online shopping from November 1st up to the 28th, uh, it, you experienced from 2013 a 14% increase. And when you look at the number of shoppers that are shopping using mobile devices during that same time period, um, those sales are up 31%. You know, so you're really seeing a transition in terms of how customers shop. So between today and Christmas, you still have seven of the busiest shopping holidays of the year. Now, in addition to that, Europe actually had a Black Friday sell this year for the first time. So even though they don't celebrate the holiday of Thanksgiving, um, due to customers like Amazon with a, lot, with a large online presence, they've really promoted those deep discounted sales. And this year, uh, Europe is projecting uh, sales of $44 billion on Black Friday. So in all, if you take a look at some of the statistics and projections, the National Retail Federation's um, expects a retail sales increase of 4.1% um, during the holidays uh, over what it was last year. 
Okay, so you know, long story short, the economy's starting to pick up. We're starting to see more freight being shipped, and this holiday uh, season is a good indicator of that. So if we take a look at the truck tonnage index, um, so there's a lot of sources of this information. Uh, primary source is really the ATA. And you've seen a steady increase in truck tonnage since 2011. Um, you obviously go through your peaks and valleys. Uh, you go through your holiday shipping season. Um, but in all, uh, truck tonnage is up about 3.2% 3 .2 um, in October compared to October of 2013. So in total, we're looking at about $862 billion in transportation in 2013, which equated to about 5.1% of the GDP. All right, so the economy's picking up. We're moving more freight. Jobs are starting to open up. Um, so then you, you start to run into driver shortages. Okay, so according to the ATA, the annualized turnover rate for drivers for 2014 is up 11 points to 103%. Okay. Small truckload fleets are the ones that are experiencing the highest turnover, and they're looking at 16 points compared to the same time last year. All right, so what's starting to happen is you've got different jobs opening up um, that maybe provides a little bit of a better lifestyle for the truck drivers, you know, specifically the housing industry. You know, when it uh, when that bubble that bubble burst, you had a lot of people that you know went to go drop trucks. Well, now the housing market's picking back up, so they can go work construction, maybe make the same type of money, and then not have to be away from their families on the road for you know days at a time. So a few quotes here. Um, this is from the ATA chief. Um, Industry revenue and average revenue per mile are increasing nicely as capacity remains constrained. So it's good for the trucking industry. Now, however, the trucking industry is having a difficult time adding trucks due to the, to the driver's shortage. Now, he goes on to say that this is as bad um, as ever and is expected to get worse in the near, time, near term as volumes continue to grow. So if you look at the, you know, the holiday season, the projections for 2015, um, that freight capacity is you know, going to continue to be an issue, you know, especially as you run into driver shortages. And then uh, Cliff Lynch uh, released a white paper, The Economics of Transportation Management, um, and in that he quoted, you know, the supply of drivers will uh, be particularly concerning as new government regulations, hours of service issues, and just the general lack of interest in driver lifestyle uh, will combine um, to exas exasperate the shortages increased carrier cost. Okay, so the, you know, as the government pushes for um, new green emissions, you know, they've got all the issues with the hours of service, you know, that really hampers the trucking industry and, and specifically the drivers. And then, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, it's just the general lack in interest with new types of jobs opening up. It's just going to continue to be an issue. <clears throat> okay, so increased volumes, tighter capacity, driver shortages is, is going to lead to rate increases. So we're going to look at this in a few different modes of transportation. So we'll start with LTL. <clears throat> so some of the larger LTL carriers have already announced their GRI, so their general rate increase for the third and fourth quarters of 2014. So as we see on the slide, you've got Conway at 4.7%, 4, 4 ABF 5.4%. Uh, both UPS and FedEx took the same uh, general rate increase this year, and we'll talk a little bit more about these two in a few minutes. Um, but those are at uh, both 4.9%. Now, FedEx, this does not go into effect until January 5th. So the general rate increase typically only impacts those shippers that do not have contracted rates. So those are going to be your smaller shippers, you know, the folks that, you know, have a, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars or less um, in LTL spend. But according to an industry analysts, those GRIs will impact a 20 to 40 percent of the total LTL business. Okay. Now it was announced earlier this week that CH Robinson is actually buying uh, FreightQuote.com. Okay. Um, and they're buying them for $365 million. Now what FreightQuote's able to do is they have a web portal 
um, where they've been able to put blanket pricing in place. So they go and negotiate pricing with the carriers, with the LTL carriers, and they're able to resell that to small shippers that can't get pricing on their own. So you're looking at economies of scale. So they're able to pull this total volume together. Now, Freight Quote has 80,000 customers currently. They actually have more than C.H. Robinson. And the majority of their customers, they do have a few big ones, but the vast majority of their customers only ship two to three shipments a week. Okay. You know, so this news, any type of GRI increase is, is certainly beneficial to them and their business model. Now, C.H. Robinson's realized that, um, and they feel like this is a natural fit for them being able to attract new types of markets that maybe they wouldn't normally go after. Um, or it complements their service. They may deal with a shipper that has a pretty substantial truckload spend or warehousing spend, um, and they have a, a smaller LTL spend, where before, with CH's model, they may not have been able to provide them with much value. Now this gives them a good opportunity to you know, show that additional value add. On the flip side of that, <clears throat> you've got the contracted rates. So according to logistics management, LTL carriers are expected to take a 3 to 4% increase on contracted lanes in 2015. So basically what you're seeing <clears throat> is that since the, reception, uh, the recession, carriers have really cut cost um, in an attempt to get additional volume. So there's a quote here. Um, in, in recent years, there was a bad period in which LTLs learned and realized price cannot be cut to chase volume because, because uh, LTL carriers end up running a lot of miles and burning out equipment for no return. So this is really becoming a, a carrier's market. You know, the volumes are up, capacity's down. <clears throat> if we take a look at truckload rates, and these are a little more difficult to pinpoint um, just because of, you know, the nature of the business with all of your flatbed carriers and, and van carriers and mom and pops. But a good source for this information is the DAT. Um, so if you go out to the DAT website and you look under DAT trend lines, they've got some pretty good and telling statistics. Um, so if you look at each individual line item, so for example, you've got your spot, spot market loads. And if you look at the year uh, from November of 2013 to November of 2014, loads have increased 28%, while the spot market capacity has decreased by 1.7%. If we look at van load to truck, the number of loads are up 37%. And because of that, van rates, in terms of spot quotes, are up an average of 9.6%. Flatbed, loads are up 45%. The flatbed rates are up 10%. Reefer, volumes are up 25%. Rates are up 17%. So if you average these together, the average load to truck increase um, for the last year is an increase of 34%. And as a result, the average rate increase is up 12%. Now, the, the, really the only saving grace here is if you look at fuel, fuel is actually down from last year, which everybody knows how that goes. That's, it, it may stay there, it may increase. <clears throat> okay, then we get to the parcel providers. So this can be a little tricky this year. You know, every, time, every year, around this time of year, beginning of January, FedEx and, and UPS will take their, their increases. And you know, they'll average them out. So they'll say, OK, it's an average of you know, 5%, 4.9%. Um, but it's not just a flat 4.9% increase. You know, certain services and certain zones and weight, weight breaks may take an increase of 25%, while others may stay flat. But when you average it all out, it, it, it comes out to their general rate increase. You know, in addition to that, they'll typically, you know, increase certain accessorials, cut others, take adjustments to fuel, maybe add a, a new and additional accessorial charge. So this year is uh, something pretty new, and it's going to have a, a very large impact on some shippers. So this could result in the largest rate increase ever for these two carriers. So the general rate increase is 4.9%, which is pretty normal. But effective, and I have January 1st, but technically for UPS it's the week before, last week of December, and FedEx is the first week of January. But effective during this time, all ground shipments will be subject to dimensional weight charges. So right now, 
their express shipments are, are, are subject to dimensional charges, but any ground shipment um, that was less than three cubic feet was not previously subject to these types of charges. So today, only about 15% of ground shipments, or those uh, greater than three cubic feet, are subject to the charge. Moving forward, after this change is in effect, every single ground shipment will be subject to dimensional weight rules. Now, some customers, it, it may not have any impact at all. You know, others, depending on how they package their shipments, I mean, they could see parcel rate increases of 25 to 30 percent. So there's a lot of people right now scrambling to be able to get that type of business intelligence to understand what kind of cost impact that's going to have on them and if they need to potentially change their packaging um, uh, requirements. So for some smaller businesses or, or those that operate on their margins, these increased ground shipping costs could be significant or even devastating. So you've got increased freight, driver shortages, capacity issues, LTL increases, uh, tr significant truckload increases, significant parcel increases. Which brings us to, you know, the challenges facing shippers. So according to a study that was provided on the SupplyChain247.com website, um, they pulled shippers and asked them what their uh, greatest challenges were heading into 2015. You know, so obviously the, you know, the largest response is going to be cutting transportation cost. You know, a lot of these shippers are going to be lucky if they can just keep their, their current transportation costs without taking significant in increases. Obviously, everybody would love to be able to cut that cost. Uh, business process improvement. Um, improving customer service. So if we think back to the, uh, the first slide where we talked about the holiday shipping season, another reason that um, revenue was down during those two days, with the online shopping now and your ability specifically with mobile, there are so many options out there for uh, customers to be able to pick from different providers. So if you order from one particular retailer, let's say for example, and you got bad customer service, maybe something needed to be returned, it was damaged, it wasn't delivered on time, well you've got 37 other options to choose from. So chances are you're not going to go back to that same provider for the product again. And that rolls into supply chain visibility as well. You know, you've got more complex global supply chain networks, um, you've got shipments coming in from Asia, going to drayage, potentially cross docks. Um, using final mile delivery carriers, you've got orders in place, um, you need to make sure that they're going to be delivered on time. If there's some type of hiccup within the supply chain, you're going to need to know that. Uh, finding, retaining, uh, training qualified labor. You know, so you've got a younger generation now that um, are going to fill these types of positions and, and they're not as loyal as they used to be. You know, so if they have another opportunity, you know, chances are that they'll, they'll you know, take a chance and potentially move to another organization. So being able to find and retain the type of talent that you need to manage these complex supply chains is becoming a challenge. All right, so let's take a look at the logistics services market. I want to throw a few statistics at you. Okay, uh, so Cap Gemini and Armstrong, Armstrong and Associates uh, did a study, they do one every year, on the, uh, the status or the state of the logistics services market. Um, so these are a few of the graphics um, that I pulled from their report to include in this presentation. So this particular slide will show you the growth or revenue um, by individual region of the world for the 3PL market. And it looks at um, the change, the percent change from 2010 to 2011, 11 to 12, and 12 to 13. So you'll notice if you look at North America, from 2010 to 11, you had an increase of 7.2%. That number started to decline um, from 2011 to 2012 to 6.7%. Um, if you look at 2012 to 2013, uh, that it's declined significantly to 2.9%. So 
what you're starting to see a lot of are customers insourcing. So where they used to outsource all of their services, for example, um, to a logistics provider, now they're starting to pull some of those uh, services back in. So down here, 36% of shippers who outsource their total logistics, that's down from 42% the previous year. So if you look at some of the uh, different functions or services that they may use a 3PL provider to outsource that, that service to, they're starting to take some of those back in-house. Okay. Now the good news is 67% of shippers plan to increase their use of outsourced services this year. So this is pretty cyclical. Um, you'll typically see shippers outsource more than they insource, and it's typically at a ratio of 3 to 1. So if you were to look at this as a, a line graph, you would, you would continuously see it trend upwards. <clears throat> so in terms of what shippers outsource to logistics service providers, you know, your top, your top functions are domestic transportation, you know, international transportation, warehousing, customer brokerage, uh, freight forwarding. Um, these are all of your what we would call operational repetitive tasks. Um, that are the most commonly outsourced, with domestic transportation being the highest at 80%. And then you start to look at some of the you know, value-add services like re reverse logistics, freight bill audit and payment, you know, uh, product labeling, cross-docking. Um, these are services that would fall into the second tier that are becoming more common you know, with shippers. And then the, the third tier are really all of your IT-sensitive, you know, customer-facing services. So shippers have been less likely to outsource those types of services. They feel the need to be able to keep those in-house. So why do shippers outsource to 3PL providers? Well, there could be a number of different reasons. So we just put these into a few buckets. And you know, I always like to say, you know, do what you do best and outsource the rest. So unless you're someone like Walmart, um, you typically you have a core competency, you know, whether that whether that's food and bread beverage, you're in the, your pharmaceutical business, you're in retail, um, and there are experts, you know, in 3PLs that you know managing supply chains and logistics is their core competency. So rightly so, a lot of shippers feel like they should focus on what they do best and then outsource those types of services to people that specialize in those areas. Yeah, another primary reason. Most 3PLs have already made a pretty substantial investment in technology. Um, I, you know, I pointed out here TMS and WMS, but that could also be CRM technology. Uh, it could be um, you know, freight audit and payment. You know, different services that the, 3P, that the 3PL have established, and they're able to allow the shippers to get the benefit of those services. So if a shipper was going to go purchase and implement a TMS system on their own, they're going to have certain you know, implementation costs associated with that. Um, it's going to take time and effort on their end in terms of getting things configured. There's going to be training. And then they have to be able to provide the staff to be able to manage that process on their own. Whereas a 3PL has already made that investment. They've already gone through the integrations and the configurations. They're trained on the services. So they're able to provide a TMS or a WMS system to their shipper at either no cost or is a value-add service, or if they do charge, it's typically a marginal fee in terms of what the shipper would have to pay on their own. Then you have economies of scale. So a shipper only knows what they know. Um, you know let's just take LTL as an example. You know, on their own, they may only have uh, a million-dollar LTL spend or a $500,000 LTL spend. But with 3PL partners, you know, typically they're able to take that spend and combine it with other shippers in the industry, so now you've got a bigger stick to go and negotiate with the carriers. Um, also, if you're a 3PL and you have good relationships with the carriers, you've already brought those carriers a lot of business, so you know, they'll be willing to give you a couple of additional discount points knowing that you're going to manage that relationship um, and that you'll continue to bring you know, those carriers new business. Which also rolls into uh, market intelligence. So you're able to view, as a shipper, um, only your services, basically. You know where you're shipping from, you know where you're shipping to, you know who your vendors are, and you know what you spend. 
And there are different resources out there like that, uh, but when you utilize a 3PL, they've got a unique perspective on the market. So not only do they know what you're doing, uh, but they know what their other customers are doing. And again, this is what the 3PL's core competency is. Um, so you, they're able to bring that additional intelligence to bear where ordinarily you would not be able to get that on your own unless you went through some type of consulting company um, to be able to get that information. So supply chain visibility. So through leveraging those different types of technologies um, such as TMS and WMS and, and CRM and event management, um, the 3PL is able to provide you with that type of event management um, that ordinarily you couldn't get on your own unless you went to invest into a TMS. Um, so being able to manage, again, complex supply chains, global networks, multimodal chains, um, and being able to provide you with different uh, proactive event notifications, you know, making sure that that order fill rate and that delivery time you know, meets those SLAs that you've negotiated with the 3PL. And then the last item here is talent acquisition. Um, so again, you know, with this, this new generation, everybody coming out of college, baby boomers are starting to retire, it's uh, more difficult than ever for companies to be able to uh, gain talent and more importantly retain that talent. Um, so they may spend a good portion of time training an individual in different areas of the supply chain because now, nowadays, you can't just focus on one specific area. So you've got to be knowledgeable in warehouse, and you've got to be knowledgeable in vendor management. Um, you've got to have a, a good uh, computer or IT acumen. Um, you, you've got to understand log logistics, uh, uh, trade compliance. So there's so many different facets to it. Um, shippers spend and invest a lot of time in training individuals just to see them leave. Well, a 3PL is able to bring that type of talent and expertise to the table. Okay, so challenges facing the 3PL market. So there's a, there's a lot of different challenges, just like with shippers. So we, we just pulled out a few to highlight today. Um, so we'll go through these. So the first, L, L, 3PLs must reduce cost but aren't sure of the impact on profitability. <clears throat> well, in 2015, this is going to be even become more important because as a 3PL, you get rate increases from your carriers. You're going to want to try to pass those rate increases on to your customers, or you may not. You may just absorb those increases, but you've got to have a good way to understand what type of impact that's going to have on your profitability by customer, by carrier, by mode, by lane. And a lot of 3PLs struggle to be able to determine that. So 3PLs want to provide a dif a, a differentiated services but are struggling to conform to customer requirements. Okay, so there's a statistic here to the left. So 80% say that providing differentiated value is important, yet 96% state that adapting to customer needs is an issue. So again, if we think back to the holiday slide, um, the consumer is starting to shop in a different way. Uh, the the industry is changing, you know, with with the advent of new technologies and mobile devices. So customer requirements are becoming new. Um, they're much more agile now than they used to be, and they expect their 3PL uh, to be able to adapt. And at the same time, a lot of customers, shippers, are starting to consolidate 3PLs. So where a shipper may have used three or four before. You know, they're consolidating to one 3PL. So it's even more important for 3PLs to be able to, to differentiate themselves in the market um, and not become a commodity and just be impacted on price. So they've got to be able to adapt with new IT, new technologies, and become more agile than ever before. So 3PLs know that supply chain visibility is important but may not have the technology to provide it. Um, so again, there's your very basic track and trace, so FedEx tracking, they send you maybe like an EDI 214 and you're able to track it. Or you even you go to the carrier website and you pull down the information. But now uh, with globalization, it's becoming much more complicated. So you've got to be able to track an order from the time, it, let's say, it leaves the distribution center in, in, in mainland China through the port, you know, over the ocean, through, through customs, through drainage, you know, through your, um, your uh, uh, pull point or cross dock. You know, to final delivery to the customer. And you've got to know anytime there's some type of exception within that process. 
or ETAs and when you expect that order to, to arrive. And then be able to provide those back-end metrics as well on performance. So three PLs want to share continuous improvement gains but don't have a basis for valuing the improvements. So this really goes back to the second bullet in terms of differentiated services. So there's different ways that 3PLs can help reduce overall cost of a shipper that aren't necessarily related to just carrier rates. But it's difficult for 3PLs to be able to quantify those types of improvements back to the customer. So it's important that you have processes in place where you can establish benchmarks, you can track against those benchmarks, and then you have the business intelligence capabilities to be able to show your shipper or your customer exactly what your services have been able to save. And again, the three PLs know that they must be agile and flexible, but may be limited in this regard by their technology. So if you've, in, let's say you've invested, and not to pick on any, any of our competitors, but let's say you've invested in like an OTM system, you know, or a very expensive piece of TMS technology. Um, and now you bring on a new account and they have some new type of requirement. So now you've got to be able to adapt to that. Or you've got an existing customer and they've just acquired a new company and now they, they have a new process requirement. Well, being able to make those types of changes pretty quickly um, are very important to you being able to retain your customer's business. Because if it's difficult um, for you to be agile and flexible and meet their needs, they'll go and find a new partner. So it's almost like the, it's like the saying, you know, trying to turn a battleship in a bathtub. You know, it's very difficult and time, timely and very expensive to be able to make those types of changes. So you need a system that is agile and adaptable and is easily configurable. So IT capabilities that shippers fill 3PLs must possess. Um, so this goes back to the Capgemini uh, white paper that they did for the uh, 2015 3PL survey. So you've got 2013, 14, and 15. We're going to focus on 2014. Um, so you have 3PL users. So these are the customers, the shippers. And then you have what 3PLs feel like they must possess to, in order to support their customer. So you've got a lot of the um, operational transportation ex execution technologies. So transportation management. So they've got to have a system that's 75%. Got to have a system that can automate that process. So being able to, you know, rate shock carriers, execute loads, tender with the carriers, uh, be able to print all the necessary shipping documents. Your warehouse management. Your EDI um, uh, uh, different data sets. So when you look at a lot of the, you know, the large retailers or even mid-sized retailers, you know, the big box stores, um, they have a requirement that you have to be EDI capable. You know, so maybe it's an ASN or be able to process 214s, you know, or receive 204s. Um, that's becoming more a more common requirement, and a lot of times to be able to go and set something up like that on your own through use of vans can be pretty expensive. So the transportation management, you know, being able to look at planning scenarios, what if analysis, optimization te technology with load consolidation, um, you know, web portals for booking, order tracking and inventory, uh, transportation sourcing, so you can just go down the list. Now there are a couple of new things that have started to pop up in 2015 that weren't previously tracked. So cloud-based information technologies. Um, so, you know, everything's starting to move to the cloud. You know, processing feeds, uh, processing speeds are faster. Security's there. Um, most of your major providers are moving to that cloud-based type technology, and then uh, mobile technologies. Okay. So then we get to the IT gap between shippers and 3PLs. So you've got two different graphs here, bars in the graph. So you've got IT capabilities that are a necessary element of the 3PL expertise. So this is what they feel the, the, the 3PL should be able to achieve. So 96% of those polled feel like 3PL should have the necessary IT expertise to support the business. And then shippers satisfied with the 3PL IT capabilities. It's only 60%. So only 60% of shippers feel like they're satisfied with their 3PL's current IT capabilities. So that's a 30, 36% difference. 
and this is tracked all the way from 02 up to 2014. <clears throat> Okay, so let's take a look at uh, CTSI and, and our company overview. So CTSI, um, our, our global operation is headquartered in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, we are a privately held company. Uh, we've been in business going on 60 years. Uh, we're owned by a gentleman by the name of Ken Hazen, who's owned the company a little over 30 years. You know, so we're a, a very stable company in the market. Where it says that we support 10,000 plus carriers covering all modes, this means that we have over 10,000 carriers in our network. So we have some type of integration with these carriers. You know, we're either receiving tracking feeds electronically, um, pushing uh, load requests electronically, receiving invoices electronically from these carriers, or paying their bills. And this really spans all modes. So you've got parcel, courier, LTL, truckload, rail, ocean, heavyweight air, domestic and international. Now, through our systems, we process a little over 3 million transactions a day. If you factor in the different 214s, um, that's probably closer to 17 million. But excluding the 214 feeds, you're looking at about 3 million transactions a day. Now, where it says we have over 128 terabytes of online data storage, what this means is that we have all of those shipping transactions on our data warehouse, and we're able to go and data mine um, that information to be able to provide different analytics and market intelligence. You know, so to similar process of what the DAT's able to provide with what they capture, we have similar capabilities. And then we've processed over six billion dollars um, in freight on our freight bill audit and payment side. So we do have a global footprint. Um, so our corporate headquarters is located in Memphis. We have another uh, facility in Atlanta, Georgia. We have an operations facility in Limerick, Ireland, an operations facility in Chennai, India, and another facility in Singapore. Um, so we've strategically set up these offices to be able to provide you know, local support for our global accounts. So these are um, all wholly owned CTSI facilities. We don't partner with other companies. We don't outsource services. So these are all CTSI employees. So if we're dealing with a customer, um, in Europe, or carriers in Europe, they're going to be supported out of, out of our Limerick Island. If we're dealing with customers in Asia, then they're going to deal with folks over in our Singapore office. <clears throat> At a high level, there are three primary services um, that we offer to our customers. So the first is what we call logistics management, which is TMS. So we have a web-based software-as-a-service TMS model. Um, within our TMS suite, we have applications. So if you think about like an iPhone, you're able to download different apps that have different uh, functionality. It's a similar type of process within our TMS. So you're able to go and turn on the applications that you want and only those applications that you want without having to purchase the entire suite. So we'll cover these in a little more detail um, in just a few minutes in terms of the functionality associated with each of the modules. The other service is Audit and Pay. Um, so we're one of the world's largest third-party audit companies. So again, we uh, paid $6 billion in, um, in uh, freight dollars last year. And we're able to support domestic and international. We're able to pay in multiple currencies. We're able to support all modes, carriers, and services. So we do a lot of all modes. And to give you an example, um, this year we processed about $1.5 billion in FedEx and about $1.5 billion in UPS. And then we're able to automate a lot of um, accounts payable related processes. So we can automate account coding, um, different cost center allocations, business role validations, etc. And then the third service is our consulting division. It's what we call our carrier management services. Um, so through our you know, benchmarking and, and market intelligence, um, we're able to support you um, in terms of rate negotiations. So now as a 3PO, you know, that's, uh, that freight outsourcing is one of the value adds that you provide to your customers. Well, we can support you in those endeavors. So in other words, um, let's say, for example, you do an LTL bid. We could help do benchmarks to give you an idea of what the market will bear. And as the proposals come back in, we can do the back-end analysis uh, to determine who gave you the most optimal rate, um, you know, what kind of cost impact or savings is it going to have on your customer spend. 
um, and then help you with that RFP process. <clears throat> so taking a look at the architecture of our system. So as a SaaS model, there are certain benefits associated with that um, versus an on-premise system. So scalability is one. As a 3PL, you're going to bring on new accounts. Volumes are going to increase, at least you hope they do. So as you bring on new accounts, we're able to scale the system to help provide um, the necessary bandwidth and services to support that account. So if you look at the multi-tenant environment, um, this allows us to be able to go in and easily configure and onboard new accounts. So as you, you know, your existing customers have new business units or as you bring on new customers, um, there are more configurations and development changes needed to onboard that account. So it reduces the cost and it, and it speeds up the implementation. Going back to scalability, if you bring on an account that justifies the volume, then we could dedicate a server specifically to that customer. So high availability, um, so we have redundancy within our platform. Um, we have what we call geographical redundancy. So we have server farms in different geographies. So if something were to happen to one, you would have immediate cutover to you know, another server and not lose any interruption in service. So that sounds pretty simple, but it's very expensive to be able to provide that type of high availability if it was something you did on your own. You know, with that, there's disaster recovery. So we have different disaster recovery processes in the event that some type of disaster happens and one of the server farms go down. So then you're looking at performance. Um, since we utilize service, uh, server farms, you know, we're able to add additional web services or web servers, add additional bandwidth, add additional you know, processing engines or databases. So as the need arises, we can make sure that you're getting optimal service within the platform. You know, then there's the security. So all the different security measures that go in place um, you know, around the data and the processes associated with the application. So you have workflow management. This is where we're able to go in and configure specific business rules that may be unique to each of your customers. So you know you're not going to be able to have the exact same cookie cutter process that's going to apply to everyone. So you bring on customer A today, they're going to have their own workflow. Customer B tomorrow may have an entirely different workflow set. Um, so within the application, you're able to go in and make those types of configurations. And then the API toolkit. Um, so <clears throat> API is the ability to make a web service call and utilize the functionality of one of the applications without actually having to go to a website and utilize the tool. So in other words, uh, one of our applications is what we call carrier selection. It's a rate shop tool where you can go in and put in carrier rates and then populate a routing guide and you pass order information into it. It tells you the carriers that can service the lane, how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take to deliver. Well, maybe your customer has an order management system and they want to be able to do that rate shop within their own internal order management system without having to come to your TMS. Well, you can make that API call, um, bump up against our engine, return the applicable carriers, and then they can display those how they want within their system. And it's a real-time transaction feed. And then you have different pieces of functionality, so multi-browser support. So now it's becoming more common that people, you know, they're not just using Internet Explorer. So they may be using, you know, Safari or Firefox um, or a different type of browser. So it's important um, to be able to make sure that you can support all of those, you know, which opens up the ability to be able to provide uh, mobile device technology. So, you know, mobile devices don't always necessarily run on just IE. They may run on, you know, Firefox or Safari. <clears throat> and then flexible integration is extremely important. So when you look at integration, that can mean a lot of different things. It could be integration to a WMS system. It could be integration to an ERP system, inventory management system, integration to carriers, to vendors. It could come in the form of EDI. It could be flat files. It could be uh, API or web services calls. Um, so we do have a flexible integration platform that really cuts down on the amount of time and effort and cost um, associated with doing those different types of integrations. And then finally, you have a, what we call an advanced user interface. Um, so these are very modern, state-of-the-art um, uh, user interfaces in the event that customers don't want to use the API and prefer to do the execution directly from the UI. 
So looking at some of the applications within the platform, contract management is very important. Um, so we have the ability to take all modes of transportation and then take the contracted rates, your buy rates, and then load these into an engine. Um, so within the engine, it comes pre-configured with over 600 LTL data modules. So your carrier tariffs, your ZAR lights. We have over 20 mileage packages. So MileMaker, Rand McNally, you know, PC Miler, uh, Pro Miles. Um, it's we can either load rates for you as a service, or you have the ability to be able to manage those yourself. Um, so we provide a lot of tools within the application to make that process a little easier for you in the event that you want to do that. Um, so you can do mass imports, exports through Excel, um, mass updates, uh, different search functionality, group buys, uh, things like that to be able to, again, ease the process of, of loading rates. So within the system, we're able to manage different uh, revenue models for the 3PL. So we can do buy-sell. So you buy it at one tariff, you sell it at a different tariff. So for example, you buy it at a SAR 2000 with a 60% discount, but the rate that you're charging your customer is a SAR 2006 you know, with a 50% discount. Um, so we have the ability to be able to rate shipments in multiple ways and display only certain billable types. So maybe if you log in and you want to see your margin on the shipment, you can see both. Um, if you allow your customers to come in to the site and book their own shipments, they wouldn't see your buy rate, they would only see the sell rate. Um, we're also able to support gain share, so working off a percentage of savings. So we can establish a benchmark. Your buy rate, whatever that gain share split is on a customer carrier and lane basis, and then as we process transactions through the system, we can determine the benchmark carrier and who the carrier was and the cost would have been, the actual amount, so what you're actually going to pay, um, take the difference between that, multiply it times the gain share split, add it back into the actual amount for what we call a true cost. And then there are uh, prepaying ad rates or just management fees. So you do a 20% you know, markup on your cost or add a you know, flat $20 to your cost. So all of these different types of models can be uh, supported within the platform. And it does include all accessorial rating, so fuel surcharge as well as any type of accessorial. <clears throat> so again, carrier selection gives you the ability to go in and load those contracted rates um, into the engine. And this is an example of one of the user interfaces. So you can enter your origin and destination information, your weight and class then we're able to return and tell you what carriers can service the lane, how long it's going to take to deliver for each of those carriers, and the cost. So in this example, there was a benchmark. So historically, the customer would have used YRC, and that cost would have been $372. If they select or you select UPS Freight, the cost would be 233 So you have your difference between the two. <clears throat> In terms of freight execution, um, you're able to, you know, once the carrier is selected, go in and book the load with the carrier. So you can enter all the load information or we can interface with some type of ERP system or order management system to have that fed in. Um, from, from there, once the carrier is selected, um, you have the ability to tender the load to the carrier, either through email or EDI or web services, um, and then print all of the necessary shipping documents, so your bill of ladings, your pallet labels. It also has the ability to do spot quotes. So if you have a group of carriers that you want to submit a spot quote to, um, you have the option to do a broadcast load or a more of a waterfall load, where it goes to the preferred carrier first and gives that carrier first right of refusal. Um, within the execution platform, there's also a parcel manifesting capabilities. So it's a parcel carrier compliant engine. So you're able to rate shop you know, FedEx, UPS, any of the parcel carriers against one another, including the post office, do an end-of-day manifest to the carrier, and then print the carrier compliant label. So event management. So the ability to track shipments from pickup through to the point of delivery. So over here, there's a little comment. Um, 3PLs did not offer adequate uh, supply chain visibility cap capabilities to their customers will risk losing customers and revenue to 3PLs that do. So it's important, again, especially once you start looking at complex supply chains, it's important to be able to integrate to a large number of carriers in different ways. And being able to pull all that information together 
match it to certain shipment records or order data and then be able to present that in a meaningful, meaning, meaningful and actionable way back to the customer and provide those back-end metrics. So for example, in this case, if there's a pickup, there could be a pickup exception, we get the outbound uh, notification, there could be some type of outbound exception, we can track it into and out of hubs, um, there could be a proactive event notification, so if there's a weather delay or damaged freight or it gets hung up in customs, we can flag that particular shipment, uh, we can generate email notifications to users letting them know the shipment's going to be late, and on the back end, be able to track percentage of on-time deliveries, late pickups, etc. cetera. Uh, we can track the inbound record, and then finally the delivery with the POD confirmation. Um, from a freight settlement standpoint, again, CTSI is one of the largest third-party audit companies. So we can interface with each of your carriers, uh, receive those invoices, either electronic or hard copy. Uh, we would audit the invoice against your contracted rate, do any type of business validation or geo coding that would be necessary. Um, we'll handle any type of uh, support with the carrier related to payment status, uh, provide you with a lot of uh, analytics around the freight data, and we can generate customer invoices either on the TMS record or the freight invoice. So again, if you're doing, let's say, a gain share um, with your customer, and you want to wait and do that gain share based on the actual freight invoice as opposed to the bill of lading, then we can receive the freight invoice, audit the freight invoice once it's approved for payment, then run it through the gain share calculations to determine the benchmark and the uh, percentage of savings and the customer cost. And we also have the capability to do that with buy, sell, and, and the prepay and add. From there, we can create customer invoices on your behalf. You know, we can do those as EDI 210s or 110s, or we can generate you know, other types of invoices, so PDFs, Excel, you know, summary versus detail, and then be able to present those invoices. <clears throat> then you look at business intelligence. Um, so a couple of quotes here. So Galileo um, said that we must measure what can be measured and make measurable what cannot be measured. So another comment, uh, you can't manage what you cannot measure. So if you look at uh, this statistic to the left, so 60% want to share continuous improvement gains with customers, yet 94% of 3PLs don't understand their own profitability. So again, any type of savings you have with the customer or a savings internally, you want to be able to share some of that with your customer, show that value add, give them a cost reduction. Um, but a lot of people have a hard time understanding what type of profitability they have internally. So looking at some of the different reporting metrics, um, so we're able to provide daily, weekly, monthly, or quarterly reports. So these are reports that can be automatically generated on a scheduled basis and posted to the web. And then you have the ability to come in and download the reports, or you can give your customers direct access to the ports for them to download themselves. Now we are able to control what information is uh, visible within a report. So if you wanted your customer to come in and download a particular report, and maybe you do not want to show them your uh, buy amount, only their customer invoice amount, then we can uh, display that. There are on-demand report writers, so ad hoc query tools. So you have the ability to go and pick and choose the data elements that you want to include in the report. You set your filter option, so I want to see all shipments since October 1st, and then you determine how you want to receive the output. So you can get it in Excel, text, access, um, put, pull it up in a new HTML window or generate it as a PDF. And you have the option to make the report um, private or public so you can share it with other users. There are executive dashboards. <clears throat> so these are the real flashy, pretty graphs. Um, you're able to go in and create uh, key performance indicators. So those metrics that are most important to you. You can have your own internal KPIs and then present KPIs and provide those to your customers as well. These are just some examples of the capabilities of the dashboard tool. Within each of these, each of the reports within a dashboard, if you click on the individual graph, it will automatically drill into the other graphs. It's a good way to manage those, uh, those key performance indicators. And then there are more of analytical tools. Um, so an example would be our cube builder, which is an OLAP cube. 
Um, what it does is it's similar to the Query Builder in that you can go in and pick and choose the fields that you want. You set your filter option, but instead of giving you the output in Excel or text, it creates a cube. So a cube is like a um, Excel pivot table on steroids. So you'll start out with summary level data, and just by double clicking on the column heading, you're able to drill down into the detail. Um, you can rearrange the sort order, and you can have a graphical representation of the data. So I always, you know, like to present this to, to financial people, financial analysts, and I'll ask them, you know, at the end of um, the quarter, how many different reports do you have to create? And they may tell me, well, we have 17 reports that have to be created. Well, we're able to take those 17 reports and condense those down to one, two, maybe three cubes, and they're able to get at the same type of information. Then there's a modeling tool. So this utilizes the rate engine and allows you to do what if scenarios. So there's an import, an uh, Excel import, where you can take um, historical shipment data. So let's say that you have a prospect um, that you're working on and you want to be able to show them potential savings. Well, you can take you know a six months or a year's worth of their data, upload it into the modeling tool, and then re-rate that in a number of different ways to show what that outcome could be. So, for example, maybe you take their LTL uh, data, and you know that based on your experience, you can negotiate a ZAR 2000 with a 60% discount, just to keep it basic. So you upload the data into the tool, you re-rate everything at that ZAR 2000 rate, and then you'll, you can show them, well, this is what you paid, and here's what you would have paid if you were using our services, to be able to put that return on investment or ROI together. You can do things like uh, warehouse relocation studies. You can look at uh, break-even analysis. So you know, you're currently on a AAA Cooper 98, and you want to move to a ZAR 2000. Well, what discount would you have to negotiate to break even with what you're paying today? You could look at things like service level downgrade opportunities. So you ship things uh, FedEx third day, but you know they could have made ground on the same delivery commitment, and you want to see what the savings would be as a result of that. You can do those types of analysis. All right, so conclusions. So in 2015, we're going to see an increased demand in volume, driver shortages, and increased government regulations. So as a result of this, we'll see the highest rate increases for all modes of transportation that we've seen in years. Um, shippers are demanding more in technology from their 3PL partners than they ever have before. And only 60% of shippers are currently satisfied with their 3PL's IT capabilities. So if you look at the statistic to the left, so 83% say reducing costs is very important, but again, 94% state that understanding profitability is an issue. So everybody wants to reduce costs or potentially pass some of those savings on to their customer, but they have no idea how that's going to affect their profitability. And then 3PLs are looking for ways to differentiate themselves by delivering innovative, quantifiable solutions to their customers. Okay. <clears throat> then we have a list of the sources. All right, so we actually ended right on time. Um, and unfortunately, I do not have time to take questions uh, right now, but there are a few uh, that were sent over to us. So what we'll do is just reply back and email um, to everybody that had a question. But thank you for your time. Uh, we certainly appreciate it.